Good morning, fellow ruminators. Welcome back to another session of Rumination with Andrew. Thank you for joining. And uh, we are about to discuss right now a very important topical matter. Now, this morning, as I woke up, I saw in the Jamaica Gleaner online <clears throat> a very interesting story. <clears throat> I beg your pardon. Now, before I, went, before I went to bed last night, the Gleaner had on its site that warming tub that is um that is what's his name again warmington well he, i can't remember his first name and dennis meadows have been chopped so i suspect that the gleaner was suggesting that these two people have been cancelled have been fired because of their misconduct their misbehavior now the gleaner opened up this morning however and one of its, I'm trying to get my thing here together. Sometimes the, yeah. One of the stories this morning that the Greener is carrying, um, one of its lead stories, I should say, is titled, I am going nowhere. That is what Meadows is saying, that he's going nowhere. Which means, therefore, that all of this brouhaha surrounding him and saying that he's fired by the People's National Party perhaps is not true, just to appease the people and to calm their fears. But as far as these elites are concerned, he's going nowhere. And I'm sure that he would not have said it because he's no fool without having the backing of the People's National Party. This is what uh, the news story says. Despite being removed as the People's National Party's uh, that's the PNP professional candidate for Trelawney North. Dennis Meadows, who remains the party's chairman for the constituency, has accepted the consequences of action taken against him for making inappropriate remarks and plans to stay in the fight for his political survival. So um, I think that he might receive some discipline, but I think, I believe what he's saying, that he's going nowhere. Now, when you look at what happened to Rural Reed and what he did and the crime that he actually um, was engaged in, and yet still he was remunerated handsomely. He had to go home because there was pressure for him to go home. But I think that what he did, whilst the comment from Meadows was not one that is something that you expect of a politician, at his level. And maybe I should not say one that I would expect because that's what I expect, but one that should not be becoming of a politician because our politicians today worldwide have no class and they lack leadership skills and they do not know how to communicate with some level of sobriety and modicum of respect. So, you know, it's one that should not be becoming, I should say, of a politician at his level. But it's something that is expected, particularly from our crop of local politicians in Jamaica. Now, I would expect, therefore, that Warmington might not also be going anywhere. Since Meadows said that I am going nowhere, I think that Warmington, perhaps, is also not going anywhere because you know that it's a tit for tat right? It's a yin-yang. And I'm sure that if the PNP says that their candidate is going nowhere, then I'm sure that the GLP will eventually do the same. So just thought that was very interesting. So far, we have not heard, well, I have not heard, I have not read officially that the PNP or the GLP, you know, has won the local government election. But TVJ brought a news report yesterday that um, that's television Jamaica that the Jamaica Labour Party won, right? Is it seven municipalities and or seven of the different um councils while the PNP uh won five? So altogether, I would think that the Jamaica Labour Party, the incumbent, has won the local government elections. I mean, it is very interesting that only 29.5 of the populace voted in the last local government elections, which suggests that our democracy is thriving and is robust and is fantastic. What better democracy could we have hoped for?
where the large majority of the people in Jamaica do not see either the PNP or the GLP as a viable option for bringing them prosperity and taking them safely on the road of development. So kudos, kudos to our robust democracy and people like the Orlando Pattersons, the Jamaican intellectual at Harvard University. He too believes that we have this wonderful democracy. And I'm not sure he visits the island very frequently. He's there as on the, what you call it now, on the educational, he's an educational consultant there. And I'm not sure what Orlando Patterson is going to suggest to the island to revolutionize, if it were, its educational system. If he believes at this juncture for history that we have this robust democracy. And Orlando Patterson is uh, very, uh, what should I say now, um, polished and also a very, he has a very knowledgeable understanding of history. And not only the history of Jamaica, but the history of the world, particularly the Western world. And he wrote a very, very interesting book, Freedom in the Making of the West, by Dr. Orlando Patterson, Jamaican professor at Harvard University. Now, that was an interesting remark of his. And he always also, when he speaks recently, well, in recent times about Jamaica's performance, he always congratulates and he has high remarks and high regards for Nigel Claw, that's the Minister of Finance, whom I'm sure Professor Orlando Patterson knows is just a doc of the international the, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, that he's not in any way creative, in no way is he doing a brilliant job, um, as the professor suggests, but is just merely a sitting doc of the International Monetary Fund and implements and pursues all the policies that they have instructed him to implement from in Washington, D.C. So what is new? There's nothing new under the sun, because if it is another person who is coming from Harvard or Oxford, who's going to be your finance minister, he or she will be doing the same thing, because that is how the system is set up, and that is how it is designed, and you've got to understand that. But Jamaicans are caught up, as Americans are, with lots of drama, because drama is what, you know, captivates people's attention. And they're not really concerned about the policies. They're not really concerned about substantive issues, but merely are concerned about who's sleeping with whom, who committed a crime. And we're not suggesting here that when people commit crimes, that they should not be held accountable and should not receive the full force or the full, full brunt of the law. However, I do caution citizens to be very careful when you are when you see one section of the political aisle crying for blood, right? When they too, in many cases, have committed crimes, and worse than the person uh, who they are castigating. So we've got to be very careful about that. And um, so I see now that we, I hope we're settled in terms of the results in Jamaica, in terms of having the PNP, the GLP rather, winning the elections. But for what it was, uh, we can see that a message was sent to the Jamaica Labour Party and both parties, you know, um, as a matter of fact, because the fact of the matter, when you have only 29.5% of your populace going out to vote, it means therefore that there is no interest at all in politics in Jamaica. I shouldn't say no interest at all, but very, very um, low interest. And the politicians have to take that, have to take that into consideration. But I don't think they will, because that is what they want for you to be uninterested and you do nothing. You just sit back and watch them run the show and they just ride over you, wield their power over you, and you will just, let's get 
together and be all right because that's what it's all about. Just get some rasta, some dreadlocks, and and get your marijuana and smoke and sing your Bob Marley song and clamor for Bob Marley to become national hero and everything. Once he becomes national hero, because Bob Marley, let's be clear on this, had a mythical, is still and remains a mythical figure, a mythical personality, something magical about him, right? And because there is something magical about him, he is going to allow you to come together. He's going to unite all the peoples of the world. And we're going to just drink some, um, well, he didn't drink any liquor at all. He wasn't a drinker. <laughs> we're going to smoke some weed and then we'll sing Three Little Birds because every little thing is going to be all right. Baby, don't worry about a thing because every little thing is going to be all right, is it? But that is what the people of the world want, you know, and not only in Jamaica, but around the world, because I am mystified when I read the comments on a lot of videos I've watched on Bob Marley and people around the world. And he is a guy who created, you know, advocating for peace and love and harmony. <laughs> right? And that is what makes him a national hero, I, I should say an international hero, a global hero, a global icon for peoples around the world. I also wonder, we're not talking about Bob Marley this morning, but I do wonder sometimes if there was a revelation series on the big screen, on Hollywood screen, right? Whether it was truthful or not, a truthful interpretation, I wonder how many people would have gone to the theaters to watch revelation um, series, which is more pertinent than a uh, nonsensical Bob Marley biopic movie. No, so, no sooner than the movie was released than the theaters were crowded with people because that should show you what is in the minds of people. That to them, the Bible and Prophecy is something that should not be studied and should not be taken seriously. But Bob Marley and the Dr. Martin Luther Kings and the Malcolm X's of the world, and not that they have not made their contribution to world history, but they are more important at this juncture of our history. They are more important in human lives. And if you read Dr. Martin Luther King's um, speeches, you'd understand that he understood that, you know, we were vying off of the path of righteousness. And as the Bible suggests, it's righteousness that exalts a nation. And sin is a reproof to any nation. It is righteousness. And righteousness here means right doing. It's not that we are saints and we are going to, we're not going to sin and we're not Paul, <coughs> but we will have a moral compass when we fall. Right now, we do not have any moral compass. When you see people clamoring for people like Bob Marley to become national hero, something is wrong with our society. Our society has been turned upside down. And not that I'm saying here that Bob Marley did not make his own contribution in, in his own way. Right, but Bob Marley was no, you know, was no sort of this grandiose personality that we have made him out to be. And people are asking me, what have you done for society? Let me say something to you, those of you who are asking, what have I done for society? You do not have to be in the media to think that you're doing something for society. A lot of the people who are empowering society and making society run and, you know, and are responsible for the survival of society are persons who are quiet, quietly doing what they need to do. When Christ was on the earth, he was not in his time. They did not see him as any great personality because he came from a poor family, right? The disciples understood because they were with him. And they got some, you know, inner 
look at his life. But the large majority of the citizens of Jerusalem and Palestine did not understand his mission and understood that he was the greatest man, but he was a divine man that has ever walked this planet, right? And there is none that has done like him and more powerful than he, right? So it's not often the, 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 the people that humans present to us as ones who are heroes. They're not really the heroes a lot of times because human standards are low. And you can see that human standards are very, very low. Now, I'm understanding that there is a situation in Haiti in which the crime and violence have um, been tipping up, have been augmenting that country. Now, the international media houses are blaming, um, is, what's the guy's name, Charissa, yeah, for the, the optic in crime and violence. They're, they are saying that he is the one of, well, he's a leader of the major gangs who are anti-democratic or who are against democracy in that island. But what does democracy mean? And it's time for us now to re-engage ourselves, if not redefine what we mean when we say democracy. Because it's a word now that is being used and I'm wondering, it, it sounds to me to have this religious tone that I do not like. It's almost like we should, it's a cult and we should all gather around that cult of democracy. Because in no way, when we look at the world, we are not seeing where democracy is at play and where the majority of citizens are empowered. And that is the crux of democracy, that people should feel empowered within their own country. But I think that for the, in all the countries that we're seeing, including the very United States, people are seeing and understanding that their politicians are not working in their best interest. And if you look at the United States and you look at the number of wars that have been waged, including after the pandemic, during and after the pandemic, wars being waged, even during then, when they were telling us that they are concerned about saving lives, at the same time, they were taking lives. And that is something that you should have been questioning, but you have not. And the hundreds of thousands of dollars that the US has spent in waging war while you have lots of suffering in the United States and people lacking quality education and also healthcare among other um, issues and important matters. But dem democracy continues its ride, its rough and bumpy ride. And the citizens, all they have to do is smoke some marijuana and Let's get together and be all right, because that's all they want to do. Just listen to some music, smoke a joint, and then everything is going to be all right. Because, baby, you don't have to work, because every little thing is going to be all right. Because that is what it is all about. And... I think tomorrow I'm going to look at the a brief history of Rastafarianism. And hopefully I'll also be able to look at some of Marcus Garvey's thoughts on Rastafarianism. Because so often we have been taught that, which is true, by the way, it's not fully true, but there is some truth to it, that the Rastafarian movement is um is a Garveyite movement, or you know, they received their their instructions um for their movement from Marcus Garvey and give them their credit. The Rastafarians um they tend to look up to Marcus Messiah Garvey, but there are some comments, and there is a comment that 
in which Marcus Garvey has, he rejected categorically the Rastafarian movement. And tomorrow we'll be looking at that and to discuss where are we going from here and look at some of the similarities and the differences, the stark differences between Garveyism and Rastafarianism, because that is important. It's important we understand that whilst they might have an African consciousness, but Marcus Garvey's sense of African consciousness is different or was different from Rastafarianism. Right? Their methods were different in terms of empowerment, the of racial empowerment and racial uplift, two different strategies um, and methods, not I should say two different but strategies, but their methods yeah, were different in terms of how they would allow Black people to uplift their standards and to inculcate among Black people, in Black people, a high sense of racial pride. So that is what I have been seeing in the news. And hopefully that the um, that the situation in Haiti will soon be put under control. If it is not put under control, I found it interesting that in the Gleaner this morning, that's the Jamaica Online Gleaner, nothing was written about Haiti and what is happening there. And whatever is happening in Haiti, if the prisoners are released, we know that they're on the run. And some of them could end up in Jamaica, some in the Dominican Republic, some in the United States. And we're not clear about the agenda here. But what we do know, we can't trust our politicians and that they're not here to protect us as we have often assumed, right? So we have to read more investigate more and take or remove ourselves out of harm's way because right now we can trust no man, no woman. Because as I've said often on this program, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperate for wicked. For those of us, for those of you rather who are questioning my religiosity and saying, oh, you can continue to believe in Jesus. I say to them too, you can continue to believe in Bob Marley and believe in Hale Selassie and hopefully they will bring you from Zion to, um, they will bring you right from Babylon to, to Zion, to Jerusalem, because that is what we're thinking. Because the entire Rastafarian belief system came from the, er the erroneous interpretation and um, teachings of the Bible. If Rastafarians humble themselves and understand that God has no favorites because he's no respecter of persons, then they would understand the Bible. And that because God has no respecter of persons, he does not, you know, um, what should I say now? He does not see black people as being more superior to white people. If, you know, what you call black people, that is on white people or vice versa. We're human beings, and we are way inferior to a lot of the creatures in the universe. And you think that we are just, you know, we are the only ones here, and I'm not talking about aliens now and the nonsense that's coming from the media. But if you think that an all-powerful God that, all, that has all power and the, the magnitude of this universe, if you think we are the only ones here, right, you have got to rethink your positions. But that is not for us to discuss right now. But the fact of the matter is that we need to understand that our world, our planet is tiny in comparison to other planets in the solar system, in the universe. So we've got to take stock and to stop thinking that we are at the center of the universe, because we are not at the center of the universe. We might be at the center now because God is, you know, spending time to see how he can clean up the mess that we have created on this planet. Now, 
I hope that we, you will have a present day today. I'm not going to be long with this video, but I just wanted to bring you know, some important matters to your attention. Hopefully I'll see you shortly because I think I need to do a video on Haiti on what's going on in that island nation. There was something a news also in the United States yesterday in which um, President Trump is now allowed to run in the state of Colorado and also in Maine and in Chicago, I believe, where they were contemplating on removing him from the ballot because of their of the insurrection allegations. Now, that is a bright day for America, even though the liberals think that it is not, because it's important for us to respect the law and what legal minds say, isn't it? So, you know, one of the things that is interesting is that when the left, when it is it that they think that they should do something, even when it's not the right thing to do, um, they want the Supreme Court to be behind them, to support them. But when the Supreme Court does not rule in their favor, then it is that they, they are not as astute and they're not as intellectual as they should be, right? And we hear lots of nonsense even coming from, you know, respectable or so-called respectable newspapers in the United States about the ruling that that was not something they were expecting and Trump should have been disciplined. What? What's going to happen to the ordinary man when you are accused of doing something, even when there's no evidence? What's going to happen to us? And the mob cries out for blood. We're, we're going right back into the medieval era where when the church speaks, that is the final authority. When they accuse you of something, a wrong deed, even if you were innocent of that deed, then you will be sent to the stake and you would be executed and we're moving into that era. That an entire mob could be going after president, a, a former president, saying that he is the greatest threat to U.S. democracy is something that you need to think about. This is in a country that is deemed to be the exemplar of democracy around the world. That is something incredible. And you don't, you and I don't have to support Trump. We don't have to be a fan of Trump. I'm not a fan of Trump. Trump, not a fan of any man. But the fact of the matter is that let's be clear here that Trump could not be the greatest threat to America's democracy. I mean, Trump is 70, what, 70, 77, 78 years old. And Trump is not any great military genius. And even if he were, he would have to go up against a very formidable military force who are not backing him, by the way. Maybe a few of them, but not the most of them. Most of them are not backing him and would not back him. Right. So Trump cannot be or could not be the greatest threat to U.S. democracy. The military industrial complex is the greatest threat to U.S. democracy. The wars that are being waged by the military industrial complex are the greatest threat to U.S. democracy. Right. No one man could be the greatest threat. That is hyperbole. Right? That is not true. That is gross exaggeration. And that sort of hyperbole is repeated ad nauseum on America, America's uh, local TV channels. MSNBCs, the CNNs of the world, they constantly repeat it that Trump is the greatest threat to U.S. democracy. But be it as it may, he won them yesterday. Let's see what will happen as the future progresses. And I hope 
that chaos will not be manufactured. Because what we're having today in today's world, you know, are manufactured chaos, right? Or events that show us that the elites are carefully orchestrating events that will only distract us and to steer us away from the right path of development and human civilization, the survival of human civilization. We're now being treated as objects, as robots, as people who do not have minds of their own. And we've got to now take stock and we've got to get our acts together and our minds together. Because a lot of times our minds are not together. And if our minds are not together, our actions cannot be united. And we won't get, you know, some grip on doing the right thing. So I hope that you have been able to garner something from this very brief video. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. All the best to you. See you then. Remember then, remember that you need to subscribe and you need to like and share the videos and also to leave a comment that will help to trigger the algorithms on YouTube. We are being censored right, left, and center. And the only way that the video the videos can be spread is through liking them, subscribing, and leaving a comment so that the videos can be um, promoted and shared with as many people on that platform. I wonder how long some of these videos will be lasting on the platform, but God knows. So far, so long, have a great day, bye.